will continue in that direction, looking at uh, a slightly different point of view on the same uh, problem. OK, so uh, I will make a very brief uh, motivation. And then uh, want to discuss uh, some issue related to the calculation of the relic density in the, the case of FIMS. And I will do that not in general case, but I will use some very simple model to illustrate the points at hand. So I'll briefly de describe the generic case and then uh, 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 introduce another model where you have the possibility of a new uh, method of new new mode of production of of dark, uh, of film dark matter, and then I will uh, want to make a, a few uh, comments about signatures of films. So I will take the opportunity, uh, having presented this model, to give you a specific example how you can use direct detection to 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 actually probe uh, films, and then I will come back to the point that was discussed. In the, in the previous talk, but with a, uh, within a different framework, what are the different signatures of, of uh, FIMS at the LHC? So, okay, for, as an introduction, uh, just want to say the general word that we don't, actually we don't know that much about dark matter, but apart from the fact that it has gravitational interactions, and there's strong evidence for this at, at a different scale. And we also know precisely what is uh, its, uh, its relic density. Uh, hence, that would be a driving feature in my talk. But still, that leaves us with lots of possibility for dark matter, particularly from the particle uh, physics point of view. We know it cannot be baryon, it cannot be neutrino because it's too hot, but we still don't know, is it one new particle? Is it more than one particle? What is the relevant mass scale? What is the relevant interaction scale? Do we have large self-interaction or not? Is this linked to baryon, anti-baryon symmetry? So for a very long time, the favorite framework for discussing dark matter was WIMP. I mean, not only because, okay, it worked and there was a so-called WIMP miracle, but also because there was very good theoretical motivation from particle physics point of view to have some WIMP dark matter, and this was the whole framework of supersymmetry, et cetera. And hence, there was all these elaborate search strategy devised uh, for WIMPs in both astroparticle cosmology and collider. But we have no signature, so it is very important to not stay focused on this framework of WIMP, but also explore other possibility. And this really the point of view I will take now. I want to explore other possibility, not really uh, concentrate on a specific model, and also see how we can exploit the experimental uh, instruments that we have at hand to test these other kind of uh, dark matter. So there's a lot of possibility for, for the, this, okay, for the, for the interactor strength and the mass range for dark matter. So typically WIMPs live here. Uh, what I want to concentrate on is this region here where the couplings are much weaker. Okay, so we had a generic introduction to, to freezing in the previous talk. Uh, I would like to mention that the, the first, one of the first uh, examples of uh, uh, dark matter through freezing was uh, by John McDonnell and in 2002, and then uh, there was a lot of activity uh, followed uh, af after the paper of uh, Hall and company. So, Yes, yes, yes. No, no, I'm not denying it. I'm just, I mean, I, I will just exactly tell you what Francesco has said before. I mean, he, he, he very nicely made the difference between the two. Yes, yes, yes. Okay, so, uh, so the main point is that ba basically because the coupling is very small, the, the, the feebly interacting particle never reached thermal equilibrium, and um, so you assume that its density is very small, and then interactions, uh, are, although very weak, can lead to production of dark matter. So either through decay, we've heard a lot about that before, or uh, through interaction of standard model particle in uh, final state. So this is kind of the reverse process that contribute mainly to uh, freeze out. So this is the general picture for the abundance as 
uh, as a function of the inverse temperature. In freeze out, you start at equilibrium and eventually uh, decouple. And the strength of the when the decoupling occurs depend on the strength of the coupling. So the stronger is the interaction, the less dark matter you, you have. In freezing is, is the other way. You start with uh, very little uh, dark matter, and it's produced from either decays and annihilation. And if you increase the coupling, you have more, obviously, more uh, dark matter particle at the end. So um, basically, uh, calculating the relic density is solving a Boltzmann equation. So in this Boltzmann equation, there would be, in principle, two terms, the uh, depletion of dark matter due to annihilation and the creation of dark matter from the inverse process. So in freezing, this is the, this term that matter, and more generally, it can be done by two to two interaction or decay. OK, so the first point I want to make is this one here. If you solve this Boltzmann equation, I've written the explicit equation for the case of a three, uh, two to two scattering. You have here uh, this function f. So for particles in thermal equilibrium with the standard model, this is just one over inverse of one over e over t plus or minus one. So in general, one assumes that uh, we take a Maxwell Boltzmann distribution, we ignore this term. For freezing, you cannot always do that more generally because the, the, the freezing occurs, at first of all, at temperature larger than freeze out. We've seen that in the previous talk. Roughly at temperature of the order of the mass of the mediator of the dark matter. And it turns out that you cannot always make this approximation of, of uh, Maxwell Boltzmann. So if you want a precise prediction of the dark matter, you have to keep this term here. And at the end, so uh, this is just uh, generalizing the solution. And at the end, the effect of the, this correct uh, treatment can end up up to a factor two if you have uh, bosons in the initial state of the order of 25% if you have fermions in, in the initial state, and a much smaller correction if, you, if your dominant process is a decay. OK, so once you've solved this equation, this is. No, I'm talking about the bad particles. Yes. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. I can. I tell you. You know, he's asking. He's asking me what, what when I said the kinetic equilibrium. I was talking about the standard model particle, not the bad particle. And when I say a factor of two, I say up to a factor of two. Of course, the uh, effect can be much smaller. It depends on the model. Yes. It depends whether you have a production on resonance, for example. If you have a resonance production, this effect is very small. It is similar to decay. The and effect is very small. Freezing from scattering or freezing from decay? In this example, I'm talking about freezing from scattering. But, what you say you but the general framework is the same. But if you're talking of freezing from decay, the effect is below 5%. So it's not so important. Okay, but, in principle, but in principle, the same effect is there. No, any standard model particle. OK, any particle in this, what, what Francesco had said before, he had the bat and he had the, the fin. So any particle that, has, that are weak, at least weakly coupled and interact with the standard model, they're in thermal equilibrium. OK, and they have this distribution. OK, so at the end, uh, solving this typical uh, this equation, typically is 10 of being done in terms of n is done in terms of the abundance. And this leads, like usual for freeze out, to, uh, to the uh, relic density. So what about numerically? Let's just look at the simple, simplest example where you, that you can think of is standard model plus a singlet, real singlet odd under a Z2 symmetry. So this is the. Lagrangian, so you basically have only two parameters, the mass of the singlet and the coupling, this lambda H, H S coupling. The mass is related to, to mu in that equation. So basically what acts as the mediator is the Higgs, because it couples to the singlet. And you, in general, will have two possible ways of achieving freezing. So one is what I call the on-shell regime. It's when the, uh, 
the mass of the scalar is less than mass of the mediator of the over two. So then uh, you can have the Higgs decaying directly into dark matter. So this is similar to what we've heard before. And the relic density is actually proportional to the coupling square, of course, and the mass of the scalar. So that's what we see here, the mass of the dark matter for a fixed value of the coupling. So note in particular that uh, it's possible to have dark, here in this for this choice of parameter, uh, dark matter mass is around the GV. It could, for, for higher coupling, it could be even lighter. So in these kind of framework, dark matter mass is not tied to the weak, weak scale. It can be much smaller. And then you have the off-shell regime. So when the mass of uh, the dark matter is too large for the Higgs to decay into it, so then you have 2 to 2 production. So here you have decay, here you have 2 to 2 production. And the two, let me finish first. <laughs> and the two lines here show explicitly the difference of uh, obtaining the relic density if you had assumed a Maxwell Boltzmann distribution and a uh, uh, Bose Einstein distribution. So you see this factor two that I was talking about. And you also see that in the case of the two to two, typically it's less efficient process. So the relic density tends to drop once you uh, pass the limit of uh, Higgs decay into dark matter. Yes. Simple question. M, med, and M, H are the same. Right? Yes, yes, yes. Okay. This is just I did not correct that. Okay, so this is sort of the standard picture for, for uh, dark matter uh, production, film production. Now, let, let me, yes. I think in this very simple model, it's okay, but as soon as you get to a more complete model, you will have to worry about this stuff. But thank you for pointing this out, because just I wanted to point out that this is the typical size of coupling that we have for the, for the freezing. So now let me move on to something a bit more new and uh, look at other uh, possible contribution to film production beyond this simple freezing mechanism, and I will do that by Again, taking another simple model. In this simple model, I have a Dirac fermion and a scalar mediator. This time, the mediator is not the Higgs. It's just a new scalar field, phi. And I assume, just to stay as simple as possible, that this scalar couples only to dark matter and to a quark. And in addition, I will assume that this coupling to the quark is too light quark. I want also to, to uh, consider a specific case where this mediator phi is light, say, for example, 1 MeV. And the reason for that, because I have many motivation behind, is because if you have a very light scalar, you po there's a possibility to solve the cluster anomaly. Second, there's a possibility to enhance direct detection rate, hence to get a signal from this kind of model. And three, just because it allows me to illustrate some new dark matter production mechanism. OK. so. If, if you have this kind of coupling, basically you have uh, two, two pro dark matter production, either from, from quark QQ bar annihilation or from this uh, mediator annihilation. So this one would be uh, proportional to the, the, the product of the coupling square, and this one will depend only on the product of, uh, on, on, on the coupling of the phi to the, to the dark matter. So here is the general picture, what we can observe in the plane of the two couplings, which are the two parameters of the model. Assume fixing a dark matter mass to be 5 GV and a reheating temperature to be around 100 GV. So, you, so this curve is the one that allows you to reprodu reproduce the relic density. So here in this region, is QQ bar is dominating, so you have straight lines since the, since the relic density is proportional to yq, yk squared. In this region, phi is in thermal equilibrium, and hence it contributes to the, to the freezing. So it only depends on yk. And what I want to insist in the next uh, transparency is what happened in this region, where actually 
phi is not intermolecularibium, but still it can contribute to the production of dark matter. So basically, in this region, the mediator is out of the equilibrium during dark matter uh, production. <coughs> yes? What do we assume about the mediator uh, density and distribution? So how does the mediator come up from inflation? So okay. If the, if the coupling is small, they are not in equilibrium. Yes. So what do you take for the mediator distribution? Okay, so this is the whole point. Okay, so let's consider what are the process oh, that can right. bring phi in equilibrium with the standard model. So this is how you produce phi. So you can produce it from annihilation of QQ bar, emission of a gluon, uh, gluon scattering on quarks, or from gluon decays. At this point, you might ask me how gluon decay will lead you to, to phi, because you have to take into account the fact that this is in the plasma, and there's actually thermal corrections, which are very important. So actually, this channel comes about simply because actually uh, uh, gluon gets a thermal mass. So we did not do a complete calculation of the thermal correction. We just included the correction to the mass. So, so this is the QCD correction to the mass of the gluon. And this is the one to the quark. Note, note that the, the uh, gluon Correct, mass of the gluon is larger than the quark, so you also always have this uh, process open. The other effect of uh, the thermal mass will be also to regulate the propagator here in this kind of process. So if you want to compute the contribution of dark matter produ production from phi, so the first thing you have to do is you have to compute you basically have to solve two Boltzmann equations. The first one to compute uh, f, f of phi as a function of temperature and, and, and uh, momentum, and then solve the equation for production of dark matter. And the, uh, also, you have to remember that in this example, uh, the mass of the, of the phi is very low, it's 1 MeV. And you want to consider production of dark matter, which is in these examples is taken to be 5 GV. So you, look, you need to look at how many phi are produced with rather large momentum, so they have enough energy to produce dark matter. So uh, this is uh, a comparison of the distribution of, after solving this uh, complete uh, Boltzmann equation, the distribution of phi compared to the equilibrium distribution. So, it would be one if it was in equilibrium. So you see that at low momentum, this is not the momentum, it's some rescale version of it, but basically, okay, at low momentum, um, uh, the phi would be in thermal equilibrium for these values, but at larger momentum, it is not, so it's quite suppressed. Still, the difference between these two curves show the difference between the current the calculation without thermal mass and the calculation with thermal mass. So it's a very important effect in this region of parameter space, which will be relevant for dark matter production. While here, if we had chosen masses uh, that we, you, you didn't need too much energy, too much momentum for the initial phi, it would be enough to assume it's in thermal equilibrium. Okay, so this sort of, with, because of this mechanism, we get here this curve that I showed you before, that actually even if, uh, um, if phi is not in equilibrium, it can still uh, dominate uh, the freezing, and it actually also uh, depends on uh, yq Q to yk to, the, to square, but notice that the product of the couplings here are much smaller than here. Okay, so this is because the production is still dependent on this parameter, but the ratio of the F phi over F uh, equilibrium it depends on y, y q over y chi square, so this is the net result. Okay, so now since I've talked about this model and we, we can get uh, the correct relinger state for a whole range of uh, parameters, I'll take the opportunity to uh, use this to see what are the predictions for direct detection. So generically, the production for, uh, you would expect that for such low couplings, direct detection is, is completely negligible, but I'm using the fact here that I have a very light mediator. So we, usually when you look at 
direct detection. You, in this, instead of uh, writing the propagator of one Q square minus M phi square, uh, the mediator is much heavier than the momentum transfer, and you, you use that. But here, it's not possible. So what you have to take into account is here, the energy, the recoil energy dependence here in the propagator, which would be relevant for light media. Just to give you an idea of the number involved, that for xenon with the uh, minimum recoil energy at threshold, this thing is around 22 MeV square. So basically, for, for definitely for mediator below a GeV, you have to take into account uh, the correction here. And at some point, if the mass of the mediator becomes very light, the exact value does not matter because then you're dominated by this term. This also means that the recoil spectrum does not have the same shape as the case for a heavy mediator. It will peak at low recoil energy. And basically, uh, uh, one has to actually recast the, the, the direct detection limit, taking into account this fact that the normal uh, rate for um, for dark matter, for dark number of events per recoil energy will depend on this effective uh, spin independent uh, cross section, but also will be rescaled by this factor in the propagator here. So this job is done within Micromega, and we end up with uh, this figure, which shows uh, the equivalent uh, spin independent cross section and the limit that is obtained in this model. So the line here is a case where uh, it's to totally dominated by freezing, the li uh, by QQ uh, by initial state, the line here totally dominated by phi phi, and in between is our all possibilities. So you see that uh, for dark matter mass above about 30 GV, xenon is already excluding everything. When you lower the dark matter mass, there is still some uh, allowed region. And when you go to lower mass, the part of it is probed already by, by uh, for example, dark side, but not all of it. And even the projection for uh, future projects, such as uh, super CDMS, allowed to cover a large part of the uh, parameter space, but not everything. Still, there's possibility of having a signal from FIM from uh, direct detection. And this is, I've illustrated for this model, but this is typical of any model where you have a light mediator. How many minutes I have left? You don't know. OK. <laughs> OK, let, let, let. It's OK. Let me move to the, the third topic or the third example where I want to uh, discuss a little bit other signatures of, of WIM, so of FIM. So I've, as we've seen, typical coupling are of the order of 10 to minus 10 to 10 to minus 12. So with such weak coupling, can we expect any signal? So we've seen already an example in direct detection when we can see a signal if we have a light mediator. I will not talk about indirect detection, but just tell you that a few possibilities have been, have been investigated in the, in the case where you have freezing from decay. And um, signatures have been, uh, are possible uh, in the neutrino, uh, uh, for neutrino signal in ice cube, and also they can lead also to a photon and x-ray uh, signature. What I want to come back to is the issue of collider signatures that was discussed before. Uh, but I will make some uh, complementary remark. Um, so, okay, I can skip this one. So I'm interested in uh, seeing whether there will be some signatures from this, uh, from a FIMP. So I will consider a minimal freezing model where uh, we have only one FIMP. We have a discrete Z2, Z2 symmetry and where the, the FIMP is a standard model gauge singlet. And because I want to see the simplest model, I will impose the smallest number of exotic fields, but at the same time require, requiring some collider signatures. So for this reason, I will uh, assume that the Higgs portal uh, is uh, suppressed because if 
If dark matter production depends on the Higgs portal, there's actually not any observable signature because the decay of the Higgs into dark matter is incredibly small. So the case I will consider is uh, the, the case where uh, we have a SU2 vector like fermion and we have dark matter, which is a scalar singlet. So this is the Lagrangian for the singlet and uh, for the fermion. So there's a few free parameter, the mass of the dark matter, the mass of the fermion, of course, and it's coupling. So it's a case where dark matter is produced uh, mainly from decay, as we have uh, seen in the previous talk. And we'll consider both the case where the fermion can be either lepton or a quark. What I would like to uh, point out here is that when you calculate the abundance for this kind of um, dark matter, it's directly proportional to the width, and then you have to do this integral. So you see that the reheating temperature uh, enters here. So if you uh, changing the reheating temperature, you can uh, have an effect on the abundance. So this was discussed in the uh, previous talk. In my, yeah? Can you make a quick comment yes. about the reheating? <coughs> so if this equation is true if the reheating is an instantaneous property. Yes. Namely, if the thermal bath is created where the Emax and the reheat are the same. But in general, it could be that the reheating is a, a longer process. And uh, because, you know, if uh, the mass of the decay particle is uh, TeV and the reheat is 1 GeV, you pay immediately a maximum Boltzmann compression. In the other case, you pay a power of Okay, okay, but thanks for your remark, but it's just this assumption we make. So, okay, so we've seen again this, uh, we've seen this similar formula, which shows that the lifetime and how, what is the expected lifetime in meters. So typically, uh, I will allow the dark matter to be very light, but typically uh, we're talking about a lifetime of uh, several meters. lifetime of several meters. And as was said before, well, the scalar can be light, but cannot be too light because uh, at some point there's some Lyman alpha bound. So what we're looking at is the production of the fermion that case into uh, dark matter. And then there's the different possible signature according whether whether you have, if it decays in the detector, whether it decays into a lepton or a quark. So there's a whole bunch of signatures depending on the, on the lifetime, whether it decays outside the detector or at uh, shorter distances. So let me, maybe because we've seen this example, I can, I can skip that. This is uh, just the region that is probed by, by uh, searches for heavy stable tracks. It's of the order of, of the size of the detector, although it goes to slightly lower, um, lower C tau. What I want to insist on is the case of the disappearing track that was first designed for Wino LSP, where you had a, a, a Wino here uh, that leaves hits in the detector and then it decay into uh, some dark matter, ET missing, and some very soft uh, pile. So a disappearing track and one ISR jet is the signature. And this allows to uh, probe uh, C tau of the order of a few of centimeters to, uh, to a few meters. It's definitely not as sensitive of the search for heavy stable charge particle, but it allows to cover short, shorter lifetime. Similarly, this, there are some searches for, uh, for example, displaced lepton. So in particular, search for displaced electron and muon which only applies, of course, if this new F fermion decays to both electron and muons. So then you, you will have uh, an electron on one side and a muon, and then you can measure uh, here the, the distance of the displaced uh, vertex. So putting all this together, basically this is in this kind of model what can be probed at LHC, either through heavy stable charge tracks or uh, some of the di displaced vertex vertex C track, and as was mentioned in the previous talk, the, the region, here are the curves for the uh, constant relic density, 
This is the one corresponding to uh, the lightest dark matter around 12 keV. As, as you increase the mass, you're rather in the region where the heavy stable charge track are relevant. And if you lower the reheating temperature, you get in the regions where uh, the displaced vertex become relevant. And just to get a feeling of what would be possible in the future, we've also did a naive extrapolation to higher luminosity. And um, just by uh, extrapolating current expected number of, of background events, and you see that the case where the, the stable, there's a heavy stable particle uh, covers, I can't see anything, Ferdinand. Okay goes all the way to uh, one and a half uh, TeV, but there's still this hole here where uh, there's not uh, a great deal of sensitivity. So it will be very interesting to see if searches can be done to improve the sensitivity to this region to actually fully cover the uh, parameter space. Actually, in the case where uh, the new fermion is a quark, it's much easier uh, and there's a, there's a displaced jet plus met search that allows to cover all the lower C tiles, and basically everything uh, will be covered for up to about uh, 1.5 TeV. I cannot hear you, Marcela. Oh, sorry. What is the, the blue area versus the green? So the green is the... No, so the blue area is the normal heavy stable charge particle, and the green is the displaced vertex. Okay, so summary, there are definitely several viable scenarios for feebly interacting particles, which will lead to the uh, correct relic density, but for precise position, there are many effects that need to be included, including this effect of the Fermi-Dirac or Bose-Einstein distribution. When relevant, including thermal masses, and when relevant, looking at possible produ production from out of equilibrium particles. And uh, I've shown you the example where FIMS can be tested in either direct detection or at, uh, at colliders. I have not uh, told you anything about cosmological constraints on light particle uh, because there was no time in this talk, but clearly these can be very important constraints as well. Hi, Geneviève. Uh, just a comment. If you go back to the first slide where we speak about the actual search, please. The, which one? Uh, two more. No. Yes, this one. Sorry. So, one of the largest problems of this kind of search is exactly the trigger there, where you, uh, you ask for one disappearing track plus one ISR jet. And the problem is exactly that you cannot ask for the disappearing track or indeed any kind of track at level one. So all the searches of this kind are extremely limited by the fact that at the hardware level, you cannot do the tracking. You can only ask for the ISR jet plus the missing ET on the other side. And this is going to completely change for, for run four and five of the LHC because the track trigger will be coming online for both experiments. So you should expect heavy development on this area. Oh, that's very good to hear. Thank you. Provocative question, actually. So would you say that the simplest think model, like the Higgs portal, the, the simplified model one that you showed, is the simplest case and we'll never see it? Yes. yes. So let's thank the speaker again. So just to remind you, so today we convened back at 2, so we have a tight schedule now for lunch, but then the afternoon will be much, much more relaxed. So for lunch, uh, dinner yeah, so for the dinner tomorrow, who didn't sign up for the conference dinner?